It is my privilege to introduce our speaker today, Mr. Ron Deal, via Zoom. Ron Deal is the president of Smart Step Families and director of Family Life Blended, the international blended family ministry of family life in Little Rock, Arkansas. He is one of the most widely read authors on blended families in the country and is also a podcaster, conference speaker, and a family therapist who specializes in marriage enrichment and step family education. He is the husband to Nan since 1986 and the father to three boys. On a personal note, I want to say, Ron, it is uh, good to see you again. Thank you for joining us. And Ron is not here today because of a COVID exposure. But we are thankful that he is well, and I believe his family is well, but uh, they are being smart, and so we are thankful that he can join us via Zoom today. So would you please join me in welcoming to chapel Mr. Ron Deal. Well, good morning, everybody. It is great to be with you, sort of. Another COVID casualty, right? Another thing we didn't expect. Yes, we had an exposure possible exposure just last week. The good news is uh, 10 minutes ago, my doctor called and I'm negative <laughs> and so is my wife. So we're praising God and thanking him for that. I'm just sorry I couldn't be with you today. As they mentioned, I do work with the Ministry of Family Life. It's a crew ministry based in Little Rock, but not for long in the process of moving the organization to uh, Orlando, Florida, where crew's headquarters is. And I oversee the blended family ministry department. In other words, we work with step families. That's what we specialize in doing. And I'll just tell you, we're the only ministry in the world that does this. And it's really interesting because we have a long way to go. And I'll share some thoughts with you about why that is. I want you to know I got started doing step family ministry, not because it's my life, because it's not. I got started doing step family ministry because I was working in local churches working with families. I was a family minister in local churches for about 22 years. And if you're going to do that, you're going to work with families in all kinds of family situations. And uh, I just thought we should be relevant to blended families like we worked with single parent families, like we worked with first marriage uh, families. And I just didn't realize back in the early 90s when I started doing this that nobody else was really doing or thinking about it. And so what started in the local church has blossomed now into this international ministry that I'm really, really happy and just love being a part of. You never know how the local church is going to lead out. So that's an encouragement to all of you. As I get ready to share my screen here, I just want you, I want to give a shout out to Kirk McGregor, who is a recent graduate of DTS. And he did his um, internship uh, with me, actually, for his master's degree. And he specialized in working and thinking about and writing about blended family ministry. So big shout out to him. Part of his project was making this chapel opportunity actually happen. So I'm glad that it has come to fruition. Let's talk about ministering to today's blended family. I want to start with this thought. The non-traditional family is the new traditional family. Back in 1992, I took a course in my graduate work in non-traditional family therapy in which we um, talked about what it was like to do therapy with single parent families and step families. Today, if that course were offered, uh, I think it should be called traditional family therapy because this, let me show you the numbers. It is amazing how, just how prevalent this is in our culture today. Of the 325 million people in the United States, about 113 million have a step relationship that they can reach out and touch. That's a step parent or a step sibling or a step child. That's 35% of every man, woman, and child in the United States. And the projection from the demographers is that 175 million of us will have a step relationship at some point in our lifetime. Now, you just stop and you ponder that for a minute. I had a pastor say to me one time, Ron, you know, if 40 or 50% of the people in my congregation couldn't see, we'd figure out how to get them glasses or how to get them Braille Bibles or something. Like we would instantly go to work on that. Why isn't that we aren't doing something for the 40 or 50% of people who are walking around with a relationship that complicates matters into their life? I thought it was a pretty good question. Because if we look at another snapshot of uh, households in the United States, this, these are parents that are raising children. 
we can see that 40% of families raising kids in the U.S. today have a blended family relationship connected to that in one way or another. Another stat that came out just last year, this one gives us another snapshot, and it looks at generations. In other words, not just do you have a step relationship, but is it connected to your family? In this case, to couples. Now, they looked at couples. Um, so, couples under 55 was the one stat I wanted to pull out for you. Um, I'm, I'm 54, so my wife and I fall into this category. Couples in the U.S. under 55. What percentage do you think either either my husband, either the husband or the wife has a step parent, or the husband or the wife has a step child? Well, the number is 62%. So either my wife or I have a step parent or my wife or I have a step child. That's just stunning when you stop and you think about some of these numbers. And Family Life's the only non parent church organization that has a ministry to blended families with people and budget and, and, and uh, strategy. And actually, we begin to think about the local church for a minute. Um, people often ask me, well, what percentage of church members in the average evangelical church in the U.S. today are have a step relationship or a part of a blended family? And the answer is, I don't know. Nobody knows. We haven't done the research. Nobody's really looked into that. But we've kind of got a guesstimate in our ministry, and we would put it at about 25 to 35 percent. There are some churches you walk into, and the pastor will tell you on day one, I was speaking at a church in Phoenix just about three weeks ago, and they when I walked in, they said, 55% of the people who are part of this church have a step relationship. They've done their homework and they know. Sometimes it's more than that. Sometimes it's less than that. But on average, I think that's a pretty good stat, about a third of the people. Now, one more thing I want to share with you. And then, okay, so if this is true, if 40% of all the families in the U.S., if uh, a third of everyone in the U.S. has a step relationship. If 62% of couples are connected in the terms of either a generation above or a generation below, they're connected to a step relationship, then what percentage of churches are doing something about this? Again, we don't know. We don't have any hard and fast data. So here's Ron's impression based upon my work. I would say it's less than one half of 1%. Hardly anybody does anything to help couples that are living life with complex step family relationships. It really is an open door for us to be able to walk out into the world and be relevant to where people are living. Now let's talk a little bit about step family living and why there's a need for ministry. A pretty notable um, sociologist, Andrew Sherilyn said once, <clears throat> Step families are an incomplete institution. And what he meant by that was, you can't just walk up to the average person on the street and say, yeah, do you know how step family living is different than biological family living? If I were to ask you that question, could you give me three reasons why you need to do premarital counseling with a couple, one or both of them are bringing a child into the relationship, how that premarital counseling needs to be different? Give me three reasons it needs to be different and ways you would make it different. I don't know. Give me give me five ways that you would speak differently to step parents than you speak to parents about their role in the family. See, the average person doesn't know. It's an incomplete institution in that we just don't generally walk around with, a, with an awareness or strategies for doing life in a blended family. And yet it's so common in our culture. So he made, a, I think, an accurate statement that's true inside and outside the church. Step families are an incomplete institution. Now, here's the punchline on this quote. He said this in 1978. 42 years ago, step families were an incomplete institution, and I kind of think they still are. I kind of think we really haven't done much about that societally, but definitely within the Christian community. For example, we don't even know what to call them. I mean, people use, some people push back and they don't like the word step. It kind of connotes this negative connotations that come from the Brothers Grimm. Thank you very much. And so, boy, they don't want to be a, known as a step parent or a step wicked stepmother, right? And so they push back from that term and they want to use the term blended family. Well, it turns out it depends on where you live in the world. Uh, blended family is now the more predominant term in the U.S. It used to be step family, but about 15 years ago, that made a little cultural shift. 
But around the world, step family is still the predominant term when we work in New Zealand and Australia and the UK and, and Africa, South Africa, um, especially step family is the term people use to talk about this. But there's more terms that adds to the confusion. There's the merged family. You'll hear that term. You'll hear the combined family, I think, you know. Then there's the reconstituted family, which sounds a little bit like orange juice, I think. Then there's the binuclear family. It's like, wow, stand back. She's going to blow. That one doesn't sound good at all. Um, By the way, the history of binuclear came from the child's point of view. When they experience their home, most children in step families have a second home. Dad lives there, mom lives here. That's not true of all children, but for most it is. And so from the child's point of view, they have a binuclear family, two household family. That just speaks to some of the complexity that's going on there. But that's not in. There's the step nuclear hybrid family. Don't you just love that one? This is an academic term that's floating around these days. You'll read it in some of the academic literature. Sep nuclear hybrid. What in the world is that? Well, this is a blended family where they've had what we like to call the ours child, yours, mine, and ours. So it's a hybrid family where they have step relationships and nuclear family relationships. But there's one more term. This is my personal favorite in the academic literature these days, the multiple partner fertility family. Wouldn't you just love to be an MPFF, right? Uh, what in the world is this? This this is a family where one of the adults, at least one of the adults, has had a child by multiple partners. By the way, about a third of women who are parents have a second child by a different partner. They're a multiple partner fertility family, which on the street is simply known as baby mama drama. Here's my point about all of this. We don't know what to call them. We don't even have a common language to this incomplete institution. How are we supposed to make progress when people get confused by which term you use? I mean, that's just one of the issues when it comes to ministry. Do we call it a step family ministry? Do we call it a blended family ministry? Do we call it a baby mama drama ministry? I wouldn't recommend that, by the way. So this is where the conversation starts. It's not just about language, but it's also about understanding the complexity of blended families. At the end of the day, this is what we need to understand, and this is what we need to try to help them understand so that they can have healthy family living. Let me just illustrate this for you. Here's Rick and Cindy. They were married 18 years. They had two kids, Amy and Amanda. Rick was tragically killed in a car accident. Since that time, Cindy has married Larry, and they are expecting their first child. All right, let's just look at this. This is what we call a simple step family because there's only one household. Cindy is a, was widowed, and she married Larry, right? Amy and Amanda have a stepfather, Larry. When their sibling is born, that boy, it's going to be a boy, will have a biological dad and a mom. This is going to be a step nuclear hybrid family. Now, notice Rick has parents, grandparents to Amy and Amanda. Cindy has parents. Larry has parents. By the way, this is called a genogram. We use it in family therapy to just try to help map relationships and relationship patterns. Uh, I do this all the time because I can't keep up (laughs) with the families that I work with, with all the complexity of their life. So I just draw this simple map, but it illustrates real quickly um, all the complexity. Notice we have one household, Cindy and Larry's household. We have three sets of grandparents. Um, And so really we have two, four, six, eight adults who are parenting three children. By the way, Rick's parents, do you think they're invested in Amy and Amanda's life? Yeah, I bet they are. I bet they still want to be engaged and involved. And uh, absolutely. How do you think they will feel about Cindy's new child when it comes into the world? Will they be attached to it in the way that they are Amy and Amanda? Well, that actually might be quite different for them. They might have to work at that a little bit and it just might not be automatic or I don't know. Well, they'll have to work that out. Then there's Cindy's parents are connected to all three kids and Larry's parents are going to be even more connected to the new biological grandchild, but maybe they're working on Amy and Amanda. Maybe that's awkward and weird and they're trying, but Amy's like, Hey, I got grandparents. I don't need you. I don't know. It, there might be some complexity there. Now this is one type of step family. Let me show you another one. Jason and Katrina, they're dating, dotted line. They've already uh, had a child, Tamara. Excuse me, they were dating. They had Tamara while they were together. They've broken up. 
Jason is now dating Alicia. So they're thinking about marriage. This is a premarital pre-step family couple. Alicia was married at one time to Scott, but then divorced from Scott. So she's now dating Jason. And if she marries Jason, she will become the stepmother to Tamara. Okay. Now we got Alicia's parents. Jason's parents divorced when he was young. And so he has step parents. Both of them have remarried. So he's got step parents. And then Katrina. So how many parents? We got two, four, six, eight sets of grandparents. We have three adults. That's 11 parenting one child two households. Tamara has mom's house, Katrina's house, and dad's house, Jason's house. Two households, more adults. Boy, there's a different kind of complexity to this one. How does ministry look to them? Oh, but this is just type number two. And by the way, we did the math. There's 67 different configurations of step families. I've shown you two. Let me show you another one. Here's Susie and uh, John, her first husband. They got married and they had three kids, Mary, Mike, and John Jr., but then they got a divorce. Unfortunately, Bob and Betty were married, had two kids. Unfortunately, they too divorced. Betty has since remarried Frank and Bob has since remarried Susie. Bob and Susie are coming to your church. They're sitting in the pews. Every, well, they're online, actually. They're, they're trying to come sit at the pews every Sunday and be a part of your church family. And all you know is Bob and Susie. And you really slowly begin to maybe get some of the other story, but how likely are Bob and Susie to just offer the complexity of former spouses and that whole narrative? You know, there's a lot of shame wrapped up in that for a lot of Christian folks, so they don't tend to share it. They tend to hide it. Well, inside, what we know is that there's a lot of complexity to this family. You see, when Susie married Bob, she knew she was getting a couple of stepchildren, Ted and Carrie, but what she didn't quite fully understand, she was also getting what I like to call an ex-wife-in-law, in Betty. Now, Betty can pick up the phone and change Susie's life. Betty can call Bob and say, I can't pick up Ted. You'll have to have Susie do it. And it changes Susie's life. Betty can pick up the phone, call Bob and say, I'm not paying that medical bill. And it changes Susie's finances. Betty can pick up the phone and say, I'm sorry, our schedule at, at Christmas is not going to work out the way we would planned. And you guys have to change when you're going to open presents with the kids. Betty has a lot of power in Susie and Bob's world, and really with Susie's kids, who are not related to Betty at all, but you better believe she can influence them because everything's connected. If there's anything the pandemic has taught us, everything is connected. Well, Bob also got an ex-husband-in-law when he married, and so who John is to his kids has everything to do with whether Bob can be a stepdad to Mary, Mike, and John Jr. He influences Bob's ability to influence the kids. Well, there's more relationships. Susie has a connection. Her household is her kids, her husband, Bob. Uh, Bob, and by the way, her kids spend time with her and then every other weekend spend time with their dad, John. Uh, Bob and Betty has primary custody of Ted and Carrie and they live with their mom, Betty and Frank. But on occasion, Bob and Susie have all five. So they have weekend changes. They have midweek changes. They have uh, some weekends, they have all five. Some weekends, it's just three. Some weekends on occasion, hallelujah, they have none. And, you know, they've got to deal with that kind of stuff. Now think about COVID for a minute and all the things you've been dealing with. But imagine you got to manage this. Different households, different opinions about what social distancing means and what it doesn't mean. And their practices over there versus your practices here. Bob's got a set of parents. Susie's got a set of parents. They divorced later in life after she'd grown up and got married again. So it's still weird for her to have a stepdad and a stepmom, but she does. Um, there's more parents over here. Betty's parents divorced when she was young. So there's a bunch there. Frank's got parents and John's got parents. Now, oh, by the way, I forgot to count. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14 grandparents helping five adults raise five kids in three different households. Bob and Susie have a marriage. They also have our parents. They have to parent together, but they often be romantically intimate with one another. Those are two different relationships. Betty, Frank have a marriage, but they are also parents. Bob and Betty have what we call a co-parenting relationship, a former spouse co-parenting relationship. Susie and John also have the same. Ted and Carrie are siblings. There's another sibling group. Bob has a relationship with his kids. Susie has a relationship with her kids. But Bob's trying to bring Susie into the relationship with his kids. And Susie's trying to do the same with her husband. Now, Susie and Bob have a, it's a new marriage. It, the teal colored arrows in this represent old relationships, if I could say that, biological relationships where you have that natural DNA God-given connection. You're my mom, you're my dad, you're my child, end of story. Like that's never going to change. That identity is clear and defined. Yellow represents new relationships. Now notice in Bob and Susie's household, their marriage is the most 
weak, fragile, new relationship among all the generations. Think about that for a minute. Marriage is supposed to lead the home, but it's following the home. Well, uh, Bob's developing a step relationship with his stepkids. Uh, they have a biological relationship with their dad, of course. Susie's developing a relationship with her new step parents. Betty has a bio relationship with Ted and Carrie. They also have a relationship with Bob, but they're developing new relationships with Susie and with their stepdad, Frank. And the kids have bio relationships with grandparents and developing step relationships with all the step grandparents in their life. Now, when Bob and Susie get married and walk down the aisle, every single thing I've just discussed, every layer to the complexity of their home is all happening all at the same time. And did the premarital counseling address any of this? Did they get prepared in any of the courses that they do in marriage or parenting or what have you at, at their church? Maybe their church didn't offer anything. And Bob and Susie show up every Sunday and they listen to the three sermons you do on marriage every year. And they you only end up talking about husband-wife relationships, but you don't talk about any of this context that wraps around their marriage. And they are clueless. And that complexity dictates relationships and growth and connectedness. Just like life before the pandemic is different after the pandemic for, for all of us, recognize that's how blended family complexity changes everything. Now, if you're feeling just a little overwhelmed right now, <laughs> it's okay. Uh, I, I feel that way just about every day of my life. Um, but imagine how they feel. Bob and Susie come to your parenting program, and it addresses none of this. None of the co-parenting with the other former spouse, none, none of this. Do they feel overwhelmed? Do they feel like maybe it's us? Maybe we did the wrong thing. People begin to unwind in strange theological ways. Maybe God didn't want us to get married. Like They do all sorts of interesting things to try to make sense of their life, and it's just because nobody's ever put words on it to help them make sense of it. You see, Blending can be challenging. There are incredible rewards when they get it right, but it can be challenging because there's a complexity that brings stress, and stress has this unique aspect uh, dynamic in blended families. It thickens blood, which means that biological people tend to hold on to each other stronger and tighter than they did before. But biology pulls against step relationships, step parent, step child, and it certainly, at the end of the day, pulls against the marriage. I mean, if you ask me, why is the divorce rate higher for couples in blended families? It's because of what I just showed you. It's the complexity that sabotages their usness. Just like the pandemic, this is a message I've been preaching for five months. Just like the pandemic made us retreat back to the people and the places we know and trust the best. We called it socially distancing, shelter at home. Just like the pandemic created stress in our world and everybody retreated back to what we knew, the people we trusted most, that dynamic happens in blended families on day one. I'm not sure I know how to trust my stepdad, but I know my mom and I know who my dad is and I'm retreating back into those relationships and pulling away from the new step relationships. How do you merge people when they're pulling away? That's a problem. It creates marital distress and re-divorce, distressed environment for children that works against them, and it interrupts that process of passing faith from one generation to the next. Now, let me just pause for a second and cast this into a theological vantage point. We, we could start talking about family ministry and, the, and the, the theological aspects of family and how it's representative of God's relationship. You know, God lives in a communion of love, the Trinity, and uh, we're made in His image, and we reflect that in how we're born to be in community and family is a part of that. And we can talk about all those theological great ideas. But one of the things I want us to just recognize is that relationships are tools for discipleship. I think one of the biggest reasons God put us into family context is because it's in that home where we come to understand what love is. A child understands what love is based on what a parent does after they say, I love you. If the parent is harsh and angry, you kind of assume my dad's that with that. Oh, that's what love is. That's what love looks like. Uh, Martin Luther said, um, my dad was hard, unyielding, and relentless. I cannot help but think of God that way. So we just went from that's who my dad was. That must be who the heavenly father is. Like it's all connected, right? 
Relationships are where we learn grace and forgiveness and where we learn to put on self-control, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are the qualities and attributes that make for great relationships. But it's in the daily grind of working out that relationship that we learn how to be disciplined in those ways. This is Discipleship 101. I'm pretty convinced uh, one of the reasons not many churches do marriage or family ministry is because pastors don't quite make those theological connections. Like to do marriage ministry or parent education is not just about raising, you know, a, a kid with character. It's that. Plus, it's about teaching this family how to function as Jesus would. It's discipleship 101 opportunity. Now, think about blended family ministry. That's all we're trying to do. We're trying to bring definition to that incomplete institution, to that family that doesn't even know how to describe itself or what's unique or different about being a step parent. And we're trying to bring biblically based instruction to that family in order to prevent redivorce, strengthen homes so children can grow in faith, mature the people living in that household in Christ, and ultimately redeem the next generation. Let me just say something about that peace for a minute. We're not trying to create more blended families by what we do. We're not outside advocating for more blended families. Just when it happens, what do we do? How does the church respond? We're not condoning a past or someone's decision that led to divorce, for example. That is not part of this ministry. We are redeeming where they live. And by the way, if we're kind of afraid of redeeming things, we probably ought to just shut down church because there's a whole bunch of sinners in there who might think grace, you know, somehow covers their sin. I I know we don't want people to think that, but sorry, did I tell you sarcasm? It's one of my spiritual gifts. (laughs) I should have told you that on the front. So uh, we're, we're redeeming it now, not just redeeming it spiritually, we're redeeming it practically. We actually have longitudinal research, secular research that followed kids who grew up in strong, stable, healthy, blended family environments and followed them, compared them to kids who parents went through a divorce, then they grow up in either a single parent home or in an unhealthy step family home. And the kids who grow up in a stable step family environment pick better partners when they grow up. They have more of a likelihood of having a lifelong marriage themselves. They have a healthier attitude about the idea and the institution of marriage and the whole idea of it. They're less likely to cohabit. In other words, in one generation, we can bring back God's design for the family, one man, one woman for life. We can redeem that in one generation if there's a mitigating, strong, stable, healthy, blended family in the middle. I don't know what you think, but I think that's powerfully awesome, good stuff. And I think that's redemptive. How do we do this? Some quick ideas for you. Just going to lay it out. Some real uh, fast ideas. We'd love to have you come and uh, learn more about it. I'll tell you how you can do that in a bit. Um, Think about before versus after a wedding for couples, right? The pre-step family preparation versus after they're already married. There's two different time dimensions there that we can intervene and and help people. One of the things you can do content-wise is sidebars in your general marriage and family programs. I tell churches all the time, hey, you already got a marriage ministry. Great. Don't change it. Don't change it. Keep doing what you're doing. Just add a little tidbit here and there that applies to blended families. So when you're doing conflict resolution training, for example, Give them a case study and say, now, for those of you that have uh, children from previous relationships before you married, let's talk a little bit about managing the conflict around your former spouse. Whenever that phone call comes and it puts you into a tizzy, how do you manage that in your marriage relationship? Now you're using real life blended family moments to apply a principle that applies to all couples, but you're also helping them deal with complexity. It's that little step that begins to transform. Keep in mind, in your marriage class, Probably a third of the couples in there, if not more, are blended couples. They don't have a clue. When you start talking about it, you bring them into this discussion. Yes, specific programming is important. We really recommend the ideal scenarios for a church to have a, a, uh, a blended family, small group, something like that, Sunday school class, whatever format works for the church, where couples are getting together on a regular basis and learning and growing and supporting one another. I think I have a strong bias. The third bullet is strengthening step couple relationships, helping them understand the unique threats to their relationship, getting mentors, 
you know, step family couples that have been married a few years and getting them to mentor newly married couples. Those are all very powerful ministry strategies. And essentially what we're trying to do, these three key objectives down at the bottom is acknowledge blended families in the church and build a bridge for them to show up. Let me explain that. There's a lot of shame, as I mentioned, keeping couples from walking into the average church, or if they do, just coming out with their story and their narrative. When you do something from the pulpit that acknowledges them, it sends that message of, hey, it's okay. We love you. Imperfect people welcomed here. That message helps them lower their shoulders and breathe a little bit and come out and show up at the small group. And that is very important to do. Just say something from time to time, preach a sermon, an illustration on Mother's Day. Say, if you're a mom or a stepmom or a grandmother or you're a foster mom, hey, thanks for pouring into the life of a child. Just a little words like that go a long, long way. We want to create connections for blended couples. They need to walk with other couples. This is ministry 101, right? We all do this in a lot of different areas of ministry. Same thing's true in this. And then we want to be able to give specific answers to the blended family questions that they have. And that means you have to be beef up on understanding step families. You have to learn something so that when a question comes your way, you have some semblance of an answer, or it can at least point them to a resource that can be helpful to them. I mentioned that uh, I've been talking about the pandemic and uh, the lessons. You know, right now we're all dealing with what six feet away means. Have you, have you noticed that? You walk into a store and the person standing next to you, their definition is not your definition of six feet away. Like their definition is two feet away and they're not wearing a mask. And you would much rather them be, be way over there and have a, maybe 10 feet away is your definition and you want to be in a hazmat suit. Look, everybody's a little different right now. This is the same dynamic going on in blended families from day one. While they're trying to figure out how to be a family, there's some people that are ready for closeness, like two feet away. And there's other people going, "Uh uh-uh, I don't need this, don't want this. You be 10 feet away, hazmat suit. That same thing happens every day as they're trying to figure out what six feet away really means. There's so much ambiguity in our world right now. We don't know what to expect. We don't know what school is going to be like. We're trying to live it the best we can. We go to church, but it's not really church. Ambiguity is everywhere. Ambiguity is the middle name of blended families. They're not sure how to make it work. When we bring some definition to it, we're giving them answers. Folks, we have all kinds of resources. I'm not going to leave this up here long. I just want you to see people used to complain for years. There's no Christian resources for blended families. Not true. Not true anymore. The video series in the upper right is the Smart Step Family based on my book. And it's Right Now Media and it's available to everybody through Right Now Media. Um, Gary Chapman and I just released this past year a book, Building Love Together in Blended Families. And you can see we have a whole series of resources and those are just mine. There's more and more people coming together on a regular basis. Let me invite you right now, if you want to learn more about this, in just a couple of weeks, October 1 and 2, we put on once a year a two-day ministry equipping event for anybody, lay couples all the way up to senior pastors and children's ministry leaders, elders, you name it. A two-day event called the Summit on Step Family Ministry. This year, it's entirely live stream. You don't even have to leave Dallas. You can just stay there and Zoom it in. And if your organization or church buys a registration, you get the access to it for a year. You get access to our previous seven years of content. It's like 40 plus hours of material. It's ridiculous. We're trying to give it away. Um, We'd love to have you come and learn and visit and see and experience other teachers and writers from around the country who are talking about how we do step family ministry and how we do it well. We'll be taking on a number of new um, topics this year. It's really uh, an exciting event. You can see there's a promo code for you. Write that down, DTS Summit 20. It'll save you, I think, uh, 15 or 20% on the registration. I sure hope you guys can come. Let me leave you with this thought. We started worship today singing a song about, are you thirsty? (laughs) Come drink the living water. You guys know that story, John chapter four, Jesus meets this woman. And, you know, we don't know the backstory of the five husbands. If she was widowed five times, I don't think there'd be any, you know, controversy about her life. But the fact that she's there by herself, middle of the day, social outcast. Yeah, there's something going on. She was divorced at least once, maybe five times. Can you imagine that blended family home? Imagine if she's got kids. This is a multiple partner fertility family. She's given up on marriage now. She's just living with a guy. 
she's thirsty and she's been looking for love in all the wrong places. And Jesus avoids her like the plague. No, he goes and he meets her at the well in which she resides. There's a lot of ministry leaders in the world who just want to, we want to build our well and we want people to come to us rather than going out and meeting people at the wells by which they congregate and meeting them with the life that they're living as it is and then offering them living water so we can redeem their narrative, which Jesus does. And the next thing you know, she's an evangelist. Let's just keep doing that. That's all this is. Blended family, that's all this is. And there's a lot of people who are thirsty. I think we can give them some answers and lead them to the living water. Let's pray. Almighty God, you led us to living water. We were outsiders and you brought us in. Would you give us a heart for people in our worlds that are in the same situation? Would you humble our hearts? Would you um, take away that judgment that is within us that creates a barrier? Would you help us find the courage to go stand by wells, to meet people where they are, to offer them living water? I thank you for this day. I thank you for these students, this seminary. Would you bless all of it? And Lord, would you just come, <laughs> come through us into the world in ways, help us spread your kingdom and renew your world as you would have it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.